Welcome, fellow Storm Riders. You are officially a rider on the Hypnotic Storm, and welcome to session number 47 welcome. of Brain Software with Mike Mandel, and I'm Chris Thompson. Yes, he is. And the courses are selling out. He takes rotten duck liver when he has the flu. He's taking private writing lessons from a university professor, and... He's recently hired a hula dancer. Oh, true, yes. <laughs> Please welcome to the center of the hypnotic epicenter, Mike Mandel. Chris, thanks so much, buddy. And the interesting thing is all those things are absolutely 100% true. The rotten duck liver for the flu is because duck liver contains every known flu virus. And I don't buy duck liver and let it go rotten. I buy it as oscillococcinium, which is the homeopathic preparation. I started with the flu on Sunday raging sore throat then today the, is tuesday it's tuesday raging sore throat and achiness and everything got home about two hours after it started took one dose of oslococcinium another one eight hours later and i am flu free two hours two days later despite the fact that homeopathy doesn't work clearly now i will i will say i mean for those of you listening mike and i we use this app called voxer v-o-x-e-r between our uh, smartphones we use it as a it's like a walkie talkie it's like being app. a kid with a walkie it's really fun so that's often how we communicate for business and for just joking around but i mean when mike voxed me and i listened to his voice i just thought oh man i don't even know if we're going to be able to get together on tuesday and record this podcast you sounded horrible two doses of oscillococcinium and it's expensive though uh, it, uh, to cure the flu it probably cost you about six bucks oh wow that's <laughs> yeah that's very expensive now so here's how i knew i knew when i woke up this morning i picked up my phone and i started reading my email and i was bursting into laughter and my wife says to me what's going on i said well clearly mike's feeling better uh, we'll get to that <laughs> so, now let's get to the second example yes i am taking private writing lessons with my wife we have a, an English professor from Ryerson University, Cordelia Strube, and I just want to give her a plug here because she's got about nine novels out. She's a really cool writer, and she's written things like a book called Lemon and uh, Milosh and a bunch of others, um, and her name is Cordelia Strube, S-T-R-U-B-E. She's an amazing uh, writing teacher. She's given us incredible help in getting some stuff done, and check out her books. I said I'd give her a plug, and I think she doesn't believe me, but check out Cordelia Stroop's books on Amazon. They're really good. The third one, The Hula Dancer. Oh, yes. We so just hired not... on Friday night, Chris, because um, our little Presbyterian church had a Hawaiian Polynesian night. We had all this Hawaiian Polynesian food, and Heather hired a company called Polynesian Dream. Listen, guys, <laughs> it was fantastic. They do all these big corporate gigs, but they do small gigs as well, and this Hula Dancer came to our church. They had music, and we had this big feast, and she did all this hip-shaking, grass skirt stuff, and brought the roof down she was amazing google polynesian dream they're really awesome too. I, I just want to say here for those of you with any kind of entrepreneurial spirit in your in your mind or heart take up hula dance i mean think about it there is a company you can go to to that specializes in Sending you a hula dancer. Sending you hula dancers. Sending you attractive for, women in their 20s wearing grass skirts and coconuts. For a coconut, uh, co for a coconut, for a corporate gig or whatever. I mean, this was a church event that yeah, you were talking about, Yeah, it was absolutely about, fantastic. Right? So, I mean, if you have an interest in any kind of niche, 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 as some people say it, there are people who want your service. So anyway, just think about that in the Polynesian background. Polynesian Dream, Google it. If you're in the Toronto area, hire them. Say Mike sent you. They were fantastic. It was cultural. It was fun. And we just had a blast. Now, let's get on to uh, Let's talk about what made me laugh this Oh, the morning. context free humor. Okay, so let me break this down. Um, <laughs> it's kind of an odd thing. So, a couple of days ago, Mike sent me a couple of emails. And my mistake, it killed part of the humor for me a little bit, is that I read them in the wrong order. I read the second email first and the first email second. And did you notice the time frame between the two emails was about 30 seconds? I wanted you to get it right away to know I hadn't lost yeah, my Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so here's what happened. I get an email from Mike, the, the second email, which I read first, that says, just so you know, that email was an example in context-free humor, which we're going to get to in a moment. So I read the other email, the first one that he sent, that I was supposed to read first and get confused by. And it was freaking hilarious. And I mean, it's a very long one, so I'm not going to read it here. We're going to read a different example. Because there have been many since. But I laughed and I wrote back, oh my God, that's brilliant. This is hilarious. You need to start doing this more often. We've started a brand new practical job. <laughs> so I wake up this morning, I check my email, like I said. And I know Mike is feeling better because I have got BCC'd 
on something like four or five <laughs> different emails, and I know exactly what's going on. He's and just people. he stepped it up a whole several more notches of, of excellence. And so exactly. here here's a good example, and we'll we'll. I've spent some time deconstructing how now these You must work. realize this was sent to – the example Paul. he's got is a short one. But it's a good one of how you can mess with somebody's head really well in an email. And the whole point is Paul, who I sent this to, had – this was apropos of nothing. There would be no conversation about anything in this email. He's getting this absolutely cold. So I'll let Chris do and, that, and that's the whole point of it. When we say context-free – there is no legitimate context for Mike to be sending this email. To There's me. nothing they can hang anything on. It. Nothing makes sense in it. And here it is. So this is an email to Paul. Hi, Paul. I'm writing due to a concern regarding Chris. That's me he's talking about. Have you noticed a strangeness about him after class, specifically in the last two months? Not many people know this, but he was involved directly in the Joyce problem when she wouldn't leave the church back in December. It seems the concert at the church was running late, but it was no excuse for his behavior. Since then, she's been upset to the point of depression and has even left her keys and her wallet with Heather to, quote, keep them safe from Chris, unquote. Please give me any insights you can. I'm at my wit's end with this, especially since my fall on the ice. Mike. <laughs> So, I have fallen on the ice. That's true. I fell about six weeks ago. Yeah. I'm still recovering. I actually broke stuff. Okay, so let's let's talk about because this. I mean, now let's just explain why this actually worked. So what what okay. happened? What was the result of this email, Mike? Well, Paul phoned me today. We were doing a live webinar, and I had my phone turned <laughs> off. I turned it on. There's this concerned message from Paul, and he's saying, "Mike, I I really need to talk to you when you have a moment about that email." I, I don't really know what you're talking about. My my only concerns about Chris was he seems to have been absent-minded in class the last time, but I didn't know this was going on for two months. And I don't know who Joyce is or what you're referring to here. Could you please call me right away? So he's starting to connect dots that don't exist. That's for example, absent-mindedness in class. I mean, he's probably referring to last week when I felt really tired. Yeah. And now he's connecting this to the story. And he's, Which legitimizes the story, yeah. even though there's nothing in it. So he's doing... I guess we would say a transderivational search to look for meaning in what you're ripped to what find you, meaning. Now there now here is the magic. So the way I have broken this down in my mind, the way I'm modeling this is there is a significant amount of content in here that is specific and that gives the whole email legitimacy. It makes it look like there must be something real here. But there is also an equally significant amount of content that is completely made up, makes no sense, is very general and vague, like the Joyce problem. Well, who's Joyce? We don't know anybody named Joyce. <laughs> between That's why the name was, I assume that's why you picked the name. It's more startling, yeah. Yeah, and the Joyce problem. like and So I'm referring to something well-known, the Joyce problem. Oh, yeah, that. And so for the hypnotists out there, think about how this relates to the Milton model, right? This is a very vague statement. It doesn't have any specific meaning, and you're forced to try to attach meaning to it. And then when I start mentioning the church, we're in the basement of that church for our jujitsu class. So, That's where we meet. So it's a so legitimate. Paul is now legitimately connecting it with the jujitsu class. I'm talking about, you know, I think the concert was running late. He knows there's concerts in that church because we can hear them singing upstairs. And it was no excuse for his, beha my behavior. And, it, but it's not stated. Yeah, what was your behavior? It was never stated. Which then leads to... Her being depressed and leaving her keys and wallet with Heather to, Who's keep, my wife. to keep them safe from Chris. Like, what? what? <laughs> and then, so then I tie it all up by, you know, please give me any insights you can. I'm at my, my wits end with this. With what? And especially since my fall on the ice. Now, Paul's asked me a couple of times if I'm okay since the fall. So the key with this is clearly to put in enough real stuff. And then link things to it that are absolutely nonsense nonsense, and sound feasible, but you're referring to events the person should know about but doesn't. Yeah. And so the challenge here, and I'm taking this challenge myself, is to compose some emails like this and send them to your friends. Yeah. And just 
notice the response you get because it's hilarious. And this is an exercise. If you want to think of it as hypnosis training, you can because you are crafting a message that is partly specific but partly has absolutely no bearing and you in reality. want to create the state of confusion in the other person. And, and I, I said this to you earlier, Mike. I want to make sure the audience gets this. These are not mean emails. No, not mean spirited. There's it's no humor. ill will here. So you want to avoid anything that is going to cause the other person undue stress. You're yeah, you not... don't want to send them an email and say, oh, by the way, your cousin just died. Yeah, this yeah. is exactly. So the kind of thing that's going on here is confusion and bewilderment. It is and not stressful for the reader. It's just really confusing. confusing. And they need resolution because the brain needs resolution. We don't like threads hanging. And when we put enough real references in it, then the person, st it starts to legitimize the rest of it, even though there is no legitimacy to it. We need a name for this now. What are we going to call it? A Mandel. Oh, man. Okay. Context-free confusion protocol or something. Uh, I, don't I don't know. know. <laughs> We're open to, uh, We're open open to, your to ideas. ideas. Oh, let's do this. Here, if you're listening, okay, and you send one of these and you get a really hilarious response, send us the email. We'll, and if you win. We'll post it to the no, Facebook page. No, we'll give page. you something. We'll, we'll give you oh, a download. We'll definitely give you something or more than one thing for free as a download. But maybe we could also post it to our Facebook page so everyone could read it. And we'll it. take the best result. Or yeah, just but... go and post it. If you want to share it on our Facebook page, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> which is at just so you know it's at mike mandel hypnosis sorry not mike mandel hypnosis.com it's facebook.com forward slash mike mandel hypnosis all one word and that will take you to our facebook fan page one ellen mandel and you can uh, you can go ahead and post your own responses or yeah, just... we, we will send you something nice if we choose yours and we'll put your name out there but yeah uh, we need a name for this protocol of sending confusing bizarre emails that have truthful references in them but then go off into the frickin' ozone and this is really interesting chris because this comes from something i used to run called experts i worked with a friend of mine john belbeck years oh, ago yes we had a company that was specifically designed to get paid for screwing up people's brains and it was <laughs> wonderful talk concept. about a niche market no kidding and the problem is people started to hear about it so then it was harder to do the idea was corporations would hire us to come in and give a lecture on their pet subject, whatever it was. Um, you know, we, we spoke to Bristol Myers Squig, Squibb to oncologists and, and, you know, people about cancer drugs. I mean, it was crazy. We spoke to... Didn't you do one where you'd invented a... Like there's a, 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 new, a, new, uh, a new cure for the common flu. Yes. Common cold, Common sorry. cold with aconitum napella sprayed, you know, past the cell membrane, which delivers... The, uh, all of this. <laughs> Speaking to doctors. And but the idea was John would go in as the liaison between the company and me, and I would be Dr. Elliot Parn. And back then I had long hair and I'd tie it back in a ponytail, wear my glasses, and I would start by talking about their issues. And I would always have their buzzwords down. We'd meet with the person at the organization who hired us, but he'd keep it absolutely silent. So they would believe it was a real lecture. So just but it was be, a comedy act. Just to be clear, that the person hiring you knows they're hiring They know they're hiring John a comedy act. Yeah. yeah. They but, know that you're presenting yourselves truthfully. The comedy act is your stage presence was this Dr. Elliot Parn. Right. And he okay. would spring it on okay. people at an event <laughs> after dinner or something. This heavy hitter speaker, we brought him from Chicago. And we did one, you know, at the Ritz Carlton and Amelia Island. It was just incredible. So they would intro, John would intro me, sell this thing about, you know, here we have a guy who's a medical doctor with a law degree. And I have these sterling credentials. This is all pre-smartphone. Pre Nobody, pre -smartphone. Nobody can Google Nobody you. Nobody can check anything. <laughs> yeah. And then he would introduce me and I'd start talking for 10 minutes about their issues. And then <laughs> it would start to get a bit odd. And they'd be wondering <laughs> if they had they followed me correctly. And then it would go into the frickin' ozone, and I would quote Walt Whitman, a poem that never existed. I'd say, and in the immortal words of Walt, Walt Whitman, Whitman, who spoke of the human condition in terms of rail, in his immortal epic poem, the 403 out of Baltimore, he said, and I quote, and the engineer and the fireman and the brakeman <laughs> waving his long red underwear arm, all aboard, all, all aboard. aboard. And I just see people like, what? <laughs> And then it would go crazy. And we had such a blast with this. And the reason why is we start with real stuff and then it quickly it sucks collapses. You in. Sucks them the in. The real stuff sucks and you then in. And then it starts to become weird and they start thinking they haven't paid attention. And then they realize, oh, for God's sake, it's a comedy act. Yeah, and then everybody's yeah. happy. Okay. So I'm sure there's a better way to connect this to hypnosis. But it's all about affecting people's yeah, states. It's all, and you yeah. nailed it. We're, we're causing specific states in the reader of the email or the 
attendee at one of these seminars where we're creating a state of confusion. And confusion is an excellent inroad to hypnotic trances. Milton Erickson said it was part of almost all of his work. That is so brilliant. And nobody that I know has been doing this longer than you, messing with people's minds in a I non-harm way. I clearly have too much time on of... my hands. <laughs> I love these emails. I'm going to save them all. They are just yep. way too BCC. funny. In fact, if any of you uh, send one of these remarkably strange emails to one of your oh, friends, BCC us. BCC us and info, uh, we'll info read the at best ones. Yeah, it's info at MikeMandelHypnosis.com. So we would love nothing more than to get a flood of BCC emails. I don't know. I'd take two weeks in Fiji over that. Oh, yeah, I suppose that's a, that's a good point. All right. I wouldn't mind going. What's next, buddy? Okay, I want to – now let's get on to a, a slightly more serious topic here. So we have an email that was very lengthy and very detailed, and the gentleman asked us not to reveal anything about him personally, like his name or what country he comes right. from. So we're going to leave all of that out of it. Let's just call him Jack. So Jack wrote us an email, and – Basically, the way it started out is that he runs his, he's 31 years old and he runs his own company and he's on the verge of bankruptcy. And then he goes into a lot of his personal history and some of the problems he sees. He's, oh, yes, I remember he had a lot of addictive behavior. He, he's, he's at threshold now. From listening to our podcast, he's basically saying, like, I finally realized that something has to change. It has to be me and it has to be now. That's threshold. But he seems to feel stuck in terms of, the change that he wants to make. Now it's quite clear from his mentioning of owning his own business and being near bankruptcy. He knows exactly what he needs to be doing, but he procrastinates from doing all the stuff that he really knows he should do because of these addictions he has. For example, phone sex lines, chatting with people on Facebook or Skype, or just basically staying up all night doing unproductive but things. These are all relational things that, yeah, as and you pointed so out. So these are all things that cost him money which yep. is something he wants more of, obviously. And they take up all of his time at night, so they're screwing up his productivity during the day. And they are, to your point, relational things. So the other part of this situation, which I thought was important in reading his email, was that he's gone through a horrendous number of exper uh, bad, of ex bad experiences. A, hor a, a large number of horrendous experiences. Of lots, loss, of, lots of Lots of, of death. Lots of yeah. like people that have mm -hmm. just you know been killed in accidents yeah. in front of him or family members that have died suddenly. Bad things that kind of made me think, and this is where I wanted to get your feedback on yeah. it, Mike, for the podcast. So I want to make this useful for... The fellow who sent in the email. And, and also for any therapist. For any therapist, any just anybody. If you're a friend of, of people, then you want to be able to help them at some right. point. And it's useful to understand the kinds of questions you can ask. So the clue that I got out of his email was all of this horrendous loss in his life has then led to addictions that all seem to involve relationships that are almost throwaway in nature. Like calling into an adult right. phone line where you're paying money to talk to a woman you don't actually have a relationship with her, and if she was to disappear, you could call that same number and talk to somebody else again. Talking it's with a very shallow relationship. Talk, yeah, yeah, shallow. That's maybe throwaway is not the right word. Um, but I know what you mean. Talking with strangers on Facebook or Skype, uh, playing online games, whatever it is, all of these things almost seem to be replacements for the not replacements, but protecting him from the fact that you can lose a relationship. Now, let's at some look point. at this, Chris, because you raised some really good points there. For those of you into the Enneagram system of personality, two of the things I'm hearing here are systemic with personality type 9. One of them is the delaying and the delaying and the delaying until a deadline looms so much it can no longer be ignored. Mm -hmm. And the other one is finding different means to zone out to deal with stress. Which is pretty much what he's describing That's here. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. So some people do it with drugs, some people do it with alcohol, but Enneagram type 9, which is quite common. In fact, we've said many times, Chris is the most integrated Enneagram type nine of anybody I've ever met. And there's nine levels of integration within each type. But this man appears to be exhibiting the typical stuff of Enneagram type nine, zoning out, delaying getting things done until it absolutely has to be done at the last minute. Now, note too, Chris, all the things you mentioned tie into all these horrendous losses. He itemized the list. This man has been incredibly traumatized right from childhood. Oh, right from age six. A classmate dies because of a drunk driver, for yeah. example. Yeah. That's the very first thing that's on his list. Yeah, his beloved dog died right in front of him. And, and there are all these different things. He's gone through horrendous amounts of loss, losing family members and friends and so on. And so what's the Mandel model, Chris? De-traumatize right, first. de-traumatize <clears throat> first. And for this man... We didn't plan that. <laughs> right. But for this man who's listening, I would recommend 
uh, go online, find the faster EFT or even the original EFT. I recommend the faster one because it's easy to learn. Watch some of the free videos and start applying it on all of these traumas that you've listed and any others you find as much as you can and zero them. We call it squeezing the lemon. Uh, figure out out of 10 how high it is first, the trauma on each individual and be very specific. All that feeling of loss when this happened and say, okay, it's a nine out of 10 when I think about it right now. Do the faster EFT. It'll probably get down to like a four. Do it again. Zero it every time. Don't say, oh, I feel better. It's, it's still there, but I feel, no, no. Zero it every time and do this with all your traumas. Get rid of that first. Yeah, I like that. So you get rid of the trauma first, then you build up a peak performance state, right? I mean, you, there's yeah, other things you can do here. State, yep. A high performance state so that you know where you want to go. You take action to get there and you breathe and you move and you use the John Grinder model. Right. And when you're in a high performance state, you can now begin to consistently make some powerful changes in your life. The key is going to be consistency. Remember the old story or the old question, how do you eat an elephant one, one bite, bite at, at a time. time? In other words, tiny, tiny changes made over a long period of time will lead to massive changes. And what you have to do is not attempt to take on this whole, oh, my business is failing and all this. And I'm on these sex lines at night and all these different things. Instead, start making the small changes every day that you can consistently do. Yeah, I want to ask you, you know, how, Mike, much would you then maybe add logical things to this as well? So let's say he's taking all the advice that you're giving him. And I might suggest something like, look, if you have an issue with being online all hours of the night, one simple thing you can do is basically unplug your router or your internet connection or do do something so that it becomes very difficult to actually be online make it an ordeal for you such that you just you'll be more likely to take the lazy approach which is more productive which is actually just go to bed right and of course anything that you're trying to get rid of it's best to push it out with something positive rather than just try to delete the negative and that's what chris was talking about these empowering states I think it's crucial that you delete all the trauma first, mm -hmm. but recognize that all of these things that are indicated here, um, all of these different behaviors are all the same thing. They're all a means of changing his state. Mm -hmm. Everybody, every single client who ever came to see me for years and years and years all wanted the exact same thing. They all wanted to feel better. And when we find ways to feel better through drugs or alcohol or other ways that aren't very useful. I always say alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. <laughs> Those are the things you want to avoid. He's finding addictive behaviors to zone out and take his mind off this other stuff. But he's going to reach a crisis point very, very quickly with this. He has to find a way of dealing with those addictive behaviors. And if you recognize that I think at least, and good evidence for this, all addictive behaviors appear to be anxiety-driven. So... They quell his anxiety temporarily yes. when he's online doing these things, involving these different relationships on the phone and so on. That's why he's got to get the trauma out from underneath it. He's got to breathe and change his state. And that brings us now to that entire procrastination strategy. Yes. So, in fact, talk you, about perfect timing. You, yeah, that really does fit in nicely. So, let's talk about the procrastination protocol from Jerry Seinfeld. Right. How, and you posted this on the Facebook page. So, those of you who want the actual link to it, make sure you go to facebook.com forward slash Mike Mandel hypnosis. And then it would have been posted somewhere in mid February 2008. And 14, depending yeah, and you'll on see when a you're picture of Jerry Seinfeld holding a banana, and that's the article to click on. It was such a good article, I posted it, because someone was asking Seinfeld how he continues to write new material. Yeah, I think and it was a guy at a comedy show or something, yeah. and he came, he was backstage, backstage, and he said, you know, tell me, you seem to always come up with this amazing material. How is it that you got so and darn he good? he did it through consistency, through consistently writing. And the, beauty, the reason I posted this is it, you don't have to be a comedian to use this. I'm using this strategy myself right now, and so is my wife. Yeah. The thing is you find what you want to change. Say you're a writer and you need to write 500 words a day, or you want to get back in shape, you want to exercise. Or just or, a writer that wants to write a book. Let's wants say, to write a book, or you want to become, but you have a deadline, or, or you have some number that you're thinking of, or someone who want, you want to be fitter, or you want to build more relationships into your life, or learn a new topic, whatever it is. It's the consistency that's going to make this work. And Seinfeld's method was every time he works on the thing, whatever it is, like there'll be a minimum dose that is recognized as minimum effective dose is what Tim Ferriss calls it. Fulfill the criteria. That's right. Mm -hmm. He'll put an X on the calendar that day. So let's say it was fitness. With me, 
every day I want to do Hindu squats, Hindu push-ups, all these different things I do, as close to that as I can. And if I do enough or even sprint to my car a quarter mile, that's considered exercise that day at 61 almost. So I'll put an X through the calendar that day. The key is you make a longer and longer chain of these X's and you never break the chain. And so when you're making the chain by filling in each day, you don't even worry about the results. You don't, you don't even think about That's the, beauty the state of it. at the end. Oh, I'm going to, I need to look like this. I need to do this. So I need to be over this problem. Every day you take action and put another X on the calendar and you never, ever break the chain. That's the rule. It is a really, really simple philosophy at the end of the day. You make the chain. And once you've gotten to a point where you have several days in a row, you start seeing you this start thing. seeing There's that visual you, feedback. It gives you, yeah, it gives you this positive message, like, "Wow, I've made this chain." And then, as Seinfeld explained it, your only job, and if, I just don't like how he phrased it in the negative. Okay, which it's not we can, to break the chain. Yeah, don't break the your chain. job is don't break the chain. Whereas we say maintain. Yeah, the chain. we would say maintain. I actually like the uh, rhyme of that yeah, as well. Nice, maintain it? the chain. I'm taking English lessons, Chris. <clears throat> and <Ready>? yeah, <laughs> I, I thought of that as well. Maintain the chain. It's beautiful. So maintain the chain, and then you don't forgive me for being crass. Give a crap about the actual results. I like the way you lowered your voice. Yeah, there, so you're just like it's the like it's sounding. Yeah, you don't care. About the actual results. So, no, in the case of writing, that's not a, where your focus yeah, is. Yeah, if you're writing a book, you don't care if you if your chain is you have to spend 15 minutes a day writing or 20 minutes, however many it is. If you write complete garbage, that's okay because you're as in Seinfeld's situation. I think his point was I just wrote new jokes, new material. Every, Every day. single day. Some of it's crap. But some of it will lead to great stuff. Yes, some of it's going to lead to great stuff. And if you get in the habit of doing it every single day, you maintain, Just maintain the chain. The chain. So to our friend Jack, who wrote in. Find out what find, you want to change. Yeah, ask yourself, what do you want? The magic question. And the next question is, what am I going to do to get it starting now? And then, so find out the minimum change you're going to make every single day. You have to have a minimum that will permit you to put an X on that calendar. And I did a three-tier change. You don't have to do this. Tier one is my full combat condition. That's what I aim for. If I yeah. don't have time, I'll do kettlebell swings and some stretches and that. That's tier two. Awesome. If I don't have time for either, I'll do something like get on the treadmill for 15 minutes fast or something. But I'm aiming for one, if at all possible. Find out what your minimum is that is going to permit you to put an X on that chart every single day. Maintain the chain and don't put an X on it if you haven't done the minimum. Always go for the best you can. Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break here, and then we're going to touch on two important questions so this podcast may go a little bit longer than normal. The important thing that we need to say is that we have live classes coming up. So for those of you who are already following us, you know that the May Architecture of Hypnosis class for 2014 has completely sold, sold out. out. Sold and out the second week of February. We've announced another one for November, and that one is actually quite quite quickly filling up. So it's not sold out yet as we record this in late February, but I guarantee that by the time the spring rolls around, I think the spots are all going to be gone. So if you're interested in coming out for a live hypnosis training with Mike for five days in Toronto, check out MikeMandelHypnosis.com forward slash class and while you're at the website you might also be interested in mindscaping which is a weekend long course in june and graphology which is another weekend long course in september and all of these courses have people signing up already um and it's february awesome. so our courses sell out people know the quality of what they're getting check it out look at our stuff online okay so we need to wrap up with a couple of topics that i promised john in oshawa that we would address on podcast 47 and these are really good questions that have come up before yeah and i want to address them really clearly so let's spend a couple of minutes on this first one the first one is about hypnosis so he had been asking about hypnosis and wanting to really experience concrete results that prove it's working and the example that he had in mind was you know i don't normally dance like a chicken but i wouldn't be opposed to doing so essentially as a hypnotic convincer being told that you're going to dance like a chicken in a state of hypnosis and would you be willing to do that for me on the basis of me only paying you if it works kind of thing so it brings up a really important point and that is the topic of whether or not any hypnotist with a live subject, we're not talking about digital products where it's easy to offer a money back guarantee. We always do. We're talking about somebody who's hiring you to spend time with them. Should you or should you not 
ever do hypnosis with a live client on the basis of guaranteeing the results. I would never do it. Never guarantee results. Right. Result. And that's how we feel. So let's talk about the why because this the reason well, is very yeah. important. So first of all, people are paying for my expertise and experience and they're buying my time. Right. Regardless of any specific result. It even says that on the sheet. And that's the business reason. That's the business reason. I have a very high kill ratio working with people of making things work. But it's the same with a stage show. No hypnotist in the world would guarantee it's going to work on every single person who volunteers because some people come up just to goof around, have a laugh. Some people come up, pay no attention. The one side of the loop you cannot control with hypnosis is the other person. Exactly. You can only offer suggestions and directions and ideas, but it is entirely incumbent upon the other person to utilize that information and go into a trance. So if you were to guarantee results and therefore the client is not paying if they don't get the results. What this does is it creates a situation where they do not have leverage on themselves. Well, the leverage is they're paying you money, right? Yeah, I was hoping you'd mention that. That's a really key point. And that and it's super important because we always say this, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. We can't make you change. You have to be the one to change. You need to put your clients in an ownership position for the change that they're about to make. And when I say they're about to make, I mean, if they're committed, if they're at threshold, like our friend Jack, who emailed us in. Something has to change, some, has to be now, has to be me. Right. If that is going to happen, they need to be responsible for it. And if they let you or if you let them push that responsibility onto you as the hypnotist. You've got to question their desire to change at all. And you are much less likely to get results. So that's the real, not the business answer, but the psychological answer as to why you would never want to guarantee you results. Lose the leverage. That's why I say to my students, if you're going to do smoking cessation, charge and a you lot want of money. it to work, charge a lot of money. Charge them $750. Right. If and, there's, if there's no mean, downside. If they're, if they're paying 10 bucks a pack or whatever mm -hmm. it is now, I have no idea. And they're smoking, you know, I heard it's up to two thousand dollars a pack, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> say, no, say it's you, five bucks a pack. I don't know what it is. I have no idea. So, let, what's that in a week? Five, Thirty-five dollars a week. Sure. Yeah. So, what's that in uh, in a month? Come on, you're the well. Geez, that's, I mean, uh, that's over ten grand a year just doing that. How can it be? Sorry, per week. Sorry, fifty. Sorry, I was thinking about a pack. He's of, an engineer. I was thinking about thirty-five bucks a day times three hundred sixty-five days. So, yeah, you're talking about thirty. That year, well, you're, a pack all, a you're, day. you're approaching two grand a year. It, that's insane. So $750 is a bargain as far as I'm concerned. Plus, you're only going to get people who are serious. They have a vested interest in curing this or having it go away. And I used to even say, if you follow my steps exactly and follow these rules, you will quit. See, the problem with smoking cessation is people want to quit without quitting. Yeah. They want someone to wave a magic wand, do something so they don't have to actually do the thing that makes it go away, which is quit smoking. You have to actually stop. And... I would say to them, you know, here's the list. And if you do these things, I guarantee you'll quit and money back guarantee. But you must do everything on the list. And on the list and the is last one is do not smoke. If you start smoking, you, st you started smoking. <laughs> you yeah. I've had people phone me and say, can I have just one to get me over the hump? Well, how many, how many banks do you, you have, have to rob to, rob to be, be a, a bank, bank robber? robber? Just one. Like, I love that line. How many banks do you need to rob to be a bank robber? So back, robber? To, back to John's question. Yes, the, the leverage is really important. You want people to be committed to change. That's why I charged a lot of money when I saw clients for whatever it was, and I would weed it out and make it difficult to see me, and I only got people who were at threshold, not somebody who wanted to try hypnosis and see if it works. So make sure that your client is taking responsibility for their, their change, own change. Their side of it, yes. Okay, so I really wanted to hammer that one home because did. I'm pretty sure we've talked about it on either a podcast. I wasn't You're sure. Not quite this to the is, degree, though. Yeah, and the, and the reason why I told John we were going to do this is because I was not sure if we talked about it in an audio as part of the Mike Mandel Hypnosis Academy, which wouldn't be open to the public. I'm, right. Or if it was on a prior podcast, I just couldn't remember which one it was. And I wasn't going to go search through all the past podcasts no, no, and figure it out. Not. So we figured, let's just have another discussion about it. Here it is. That's the answer. Now, the next one, John also asked a question. And it's another question that several people have asked. In fact, just this week, we had another student in the online academy ask a similar question. And the question basically goes like this. What is with these therapeutic metaphors at the end of the podcasts? Uh, what what is it like what are they exactly they kind of sound like in, in the example of another email we got a series of just random stories that's right and that's how they're supposed to sound so let's talk a little bit about what is a metaphor and why is it important we'll do a quick version because we've got to get to the end yeah we've got to get to the end of it a metaphor 
and we'll give it in greater detail maybe on the next podcast. How sure. to construct How about if, if, yeah, if you send us questions on it, you want to know more, we'll go into greater depth. But the other aspect, basically a metaphor is information you are giving in the form of a story that has a concealed structure within it. And the content of the metaphor entertains, entertains the conscious mind and keeps it distracted while the structure of the metaphor causes change beneath the surface of conscious awareness. So there you go. It's sort of like putting your child in front of a television show that's very entertaining, but there's a moral behind what's going on in the Which story. Which may not be and, your own Yeah, it might not. Yeah, yeah. In, in the case of TV, we all know yeah. that uh, it's not necessarily the best way to... <laughs> train your children no definitely not but if you are crafting your own story based often on your own personal history mm -hmm. and often modifying it to suit whatever the purpose right. is here but you can tell the story very congruently with intention with confidence you can make it entertaining right and the brain's pattern matching system right. will find the structure and apply it to your own life and for the hypnotists out there you'll understand very quickly how you can apply things like embedded commands in there and all sorts of other hypnotic multiple tools. referential indices and all kinds of stuff like that we will do metaphors in greater depth with a deconstruction of one maybe in the next podcast i think that makes sense that's a great topic for number 48 excellent all right well here's your empowering question for today what chain are you going to start building today and continue to maintain and what is your first step toward building that chain right wow. now. What chain are you going to start building and maintain today? And what is your first step toward building that chain now? That's right. Excellent, excellent empowering question. So before we head to the closing metaphor, I would like to remind all of you to head on over to iTunes and leave a rating for this podcast. We really appreciate your rating and honest review. If it's five stars, that's fantastic. Otherwise, just leave your honest rating. Make sure you also head on over to our website, MikeMandelHypnosis.com, one L in Mandel. There is an email list you can sign up for. We're going to send you awesome content, including the Brain Software ebook edition, which has been described as people, by people, I mean, as life-changing advice and information. So check it out. It's totally free, MikeMandelHypnosis.com. You know, Chris, back when I was nine years old, I joined the 133rd Cub Pack, which was the Monarch Park Cub Pack in Toronto. We came over from England, but I grew up in the city of Toronto, not one of the burbs. And in the Cub Pack were a number of my great friends, Norm Yates, who I met when he pushed my head into a tree one morning coming out of school, Ken Hunter, who went to the Catholic school, and Gord Stott, and a bunch of other interesting guys. We all hung out together. And it was Friday night. We'd go to Cub Pack. And we do the grand howl, ah, okay, la, we'll do our best, and all this Baden-Powell-esque stuff that kept us in our little social group, our tribe. We were cubs. And I enjoyed earning badges for all of these different things, and I became a sixer, and then a senior sixer, so I got to wear three stripes on my arm. And then I got my first and second eye opened, so I had these symbols of stars on my cap next to the wolf head that was the symbol of the cub pack and the 133rd scarf around my neck that was purple with a red or yellow K for Kimborn Park United Church. And we had a blast every Friday night wearing our shorts and our cub hats and scarves. And we thought we were awesome. We felt like a little military. Well, one night we emerged from the church and it was dark and there was a man standing outside. Now this was odd because we had a man take the cub pack as our leader. His name was Art Kelly. And he was Akela from the Jungle Book. And the other two people, cub leaders, were women. Well, this night, Art Kelly had been away, presumably sick. And the women had taken the cub pack for us and run everything. So when 25 boys spewed out of the church and saw a stranger standing outside in the shadows, a thin man, face in the dark, it was a weird thing. And he was fumbling in his pockets. And one of them, I think Ken Hunter, said, Hey, who's that? What are you doing? And the man started to run. Now, we were nine years old, Chris, insane, to chase an adult. And we naturally began running up the street after him, <laughs> which is a crazy thing to do. And if you're terrified of dogs and you want a dog to chase you, just start running because they'll chase you right away. 
And that's what happened. We chased him. Oh, a couple of blocks. And he was getting out of breath. And we were young kids. But eventually he gave us the slip. And we went back and reported what had happened. There was a man standing in the shadows. And the story grew with the telling. He was tall. He was thin. He had a craggy face. He had something in his hands. It might have been a gun. He was hiding down by the bushes when we came out. And it went on and on and on. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, they actually called the police. And we gave these reports that did not gel with each other at all. And later on, we discovered it was Art Kelly, our cub leader. He thought we were all gone home and he'd showed up too early. And when we'd come spewing out of the place, he'd run away because he didn't have his false teeth in and didn't want us to see him. He was picking up one of the ladies who needed a ride. Thanks, everybody, for listening to podcast episode number 47 of Brain Software with Mike Mandel, and I'm Chris Thompson. We will see you again soon on podcast episode number 49. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha,